Tschüss. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today. And I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Inspired by Yarra. This is the podcast that has been created to enhance, connect and inspire the Yarra Valley Grammar community and beyond. So (laughs) wherever you might be tuning in, whatever part of the world, however you may have stumbled across this conversation, I want to say welcome. My name is Paul Joy. As the host, I have the best job in the world where I get to sit and have conversations with Yarra Old Grammarians, where we talk a little of the challenges, the twists and turns of life at school and beyond. Today, I will sit down with Marie-Louise Metris from the class of 2002. Marie-Louise is a great thinker. She's thoughtful. She's methodical. She's an even better talker. Tells a good story, has been able to put some words together that make good sense. She's got some guidance. She's got some wisdom. She's got some advice. We have a few laughs and we explore some of the challenges along the way. Not only those that have helped to shape her life and her experience at school and in the here and now, but also some suggestions for others who may be experiencing challenges too. We talk a little bit about leadership. We talk about her production and the courage that it takes to get up on stage. The importance of being curious and the value of having somebody to experience life with. I'm going to begin this conversation by asking her about where it all began in terms of her journey at Yarra. What year did you start at Yarra? I began at Yarra um, in 97. Um, I started year 7 in 97, so that's a good one. It's always easy to remember. It does definitely help, even in the long term, when you can go back and you go, actually, 2002 is when I finished year 12. The two there makes sense. That's a nice little way to remember because it'll get harder as you go on. Seriously, yeah, especially with my memory. So, yeah, no, um, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, so I started in 97 in year 7. And um, when I started at Yarra, there wasn't a lot of girls there at the time. I remember there was about seven girls in our, in our class and the rest was all boys. So it was quite um, a baptism of fire into, into high school. And had you come from a, a large primary school or, or was stepping into Yarra like not only the, the difference in gender, but also the size of the place. Was that a bit overwhelming from what you can remember? Yeah, like I think I came from a decent sized primary school, but I still remember being really overwhelmed um, just by everything. And just, it was, it's such a big transition, you know, I think the year seven transition's massive. So I remember being really scared on my first day and thinking I've got no idea what I've got myself into. And the place just felt so big. It felt so huge. For sure, yes. And and once you become familiar, it all makes sense. But in those early days and, and actually early weeks probably, it, it is it can be very, very daunting. I, I imagine that given the 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 volume or lack of numbers of girls, especially when you're trying to establish and who's who and get to know somebody and have some security amongst some some friends, that the girls probably stayed pretty tight, did they? And where did you hang out? Where were sort of some of the the places you would hang in between classes? Yeah, right. I think definitely in the locker room um, that was hanging out in the locker room. There's always some antics going on in there. Um, But then there was always like the um, adventure up to the the tuck shop or the canteen um, where we'd all go up there and um, I don't know what we do, hang out up there for a bit and uh, yeah, and then I think we used to spend just like a bit of time, I don't know, on the Oval or places like that. Um, but it was, I, yeah, I feel like it was different all the time, but the locker room feels like the main hub of where all all the magic happened. <laughs> and more than likely, you've probably moved in a, a little huddle though, haven't you? Like a, a group of penguins kind of huddling together and just there's strength in numbers in that sense. That's it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with the girls, we definitely had to stick together. That's for sure. For sure. Do, do, was there any um, 
camps back in those days? Did you go on a camp in those early middle school years? Yeah, there was one in year seven. I feel like it was really early on. Um, I don't remember where it was. I couldn't tell no, you, but okay. I remember it being really fun. And I feel like we had a mud fight or something like really like in, in one of those first camps. So I remember that really fondly because I guess that's the first time you really spend a lot of time together. And, you know, that's where all the bonding and stuff happens. But yeah, I remember the camps quite fondly all the way up till year 10. I think we went on camp. Yes. Oh, look, I, I agree with you. I think sometimes the 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 great social connections and some of our strong memories are from when we're not necessarily in class doing the academic side of school, but but getting out of the class and, and out of our kind of comfort zone almost and, and being who we truly are. And camps or those sort of overnight experiences are, are certainly part of getting to know each other even better. Can you remember, in addition to camps, but other co-curricular activities that were maybe new to you, like Saturday sport, was that a thing? Did you do community service? Was that a thing? Tell us a little bit about some of those experiences. Yeah, like, so in year seven, I did the production. Um, it wow. was Annie at the time. And I just remember that was so much fun. Like we had the best time doing Annie. Um, I remember it was really long days. Like we'd be at school all day and then we'd go to rehearsals at night and it, it was like really full on, but we had the best time. Like that's probably my first great memory um, at Yarra. Um, that was really awesome. And then I think I was in the choir for a little bit. That was that was pretty cool. But Saturday sport was probably the big one for me. Um, I really I really loved sport and you know, the Saturday morning, it was always a bit grueling getting up on a Saturday morning, but once you were there, like I played volleyball and netball and I just loved the team sports and I just I loved the competitiveness of it um it was really that was a really great time and I remember training so hard you know in our netball team we'd I remember getting to school at like seven o'clock or something and we'd train for an hour or so and which it was just it was a great time like I'm sure we complained the whole time but I really remember that time really fondly and um, with volleyball, you know, we played the VIX and the Nationals. So it was a lot of team stuff and we'd go away together. And um, I think for VIX, we'd stay in an apartment for like a week and play volleyball pretty solidly for that week and just hang out. Like, yeah, they were definitely my best memories at school. It sounds like some really fond memories and, and really positive experiences that you've had. And and we love talking and sharing those sorts of stories as well. Um I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the academic side. Was there a strength of yours? Did did you enjoy, I mean, you've talked a little bit about maybe some music and drama. Was that where you hung out or was it in the math science area? I don't want to pigeonhole, but maybe, maybe it was, you know, were you in the library and, and studying all through your lunchtime? So where, from an academic perspective, did you, at the time at least, think your strengths were? Yeah, look... <laughs> Academia was not really my strength, I have to say. I um, definitely was known for my socialising at school and I know all of my reports said that I talk too much in class and that's usually the thing that I would get in trouble for at school. But the areas that I really liked were English, literature, um, psychology. They were kind of like the main areas and, you know, I've since gone on to do um, social work and so I've got that influence kind of was there from the beginning. Um, so they were the subjects I really liked. And then photography as well was a big one for me. Um, that was a really nice creative outlet for me. And um, it was a bit, you know, like I was always creative, but I wasn't very good at art per se. So doing something like photography was was awesome. But yeah, uh, the maths and the sciences is definitely not this brain. <laughs> That's for sure. I'm interested to um, recognise that, during school, you learn all sorts of um, techniques and strategies and, and skills, and and sounds like talking was one of those that you had the opportunity to practice or at least found ways to practice. Tell me, how does that apply to your work now? You mentioned social work. Is, there, is that a lot about communication? Is it a lot about standing and delivering, or are you sort of working one-on-one -on -one with with clients or what does social work look like today and how does that step back into your strength of speaking and communication 
Yeah, look, um, so I um, am a social worker and I have worked at two of the main hospitals in Melbourne. I've worked at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and at St. Vincent's Hospital. Um, and definitely talking is like a major part of my job. I do work one-on-one with clients and I've got my own business as well But um, where I see clients. But I, I guess I've also been a part of teams for a long time. Um, and I've taken leadership roles in all of the teams that I've been in. And I think that that sort of stemmed from Yarra. Like, I think I was always a bit of a leader. I was a prefect and I was house captain at school. But it just, I think, um, I don't know, I think those skills that I learned early on, even though I kind of had a natural instinct for it, were really started to develop at school um and then it just kind of naturally progressed that way you know once I went into um into these hospital systems and I was working in teams it just I kind of worked my way up the up up the pecking order and you know ended up being you know in charge of a few teams and it's a lot of talking you know it's a lot of you're working in a team with you know psychologists dietitians psychiatrists you know it's 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 big so you've kind of you've got to be quite talkative. And then um, the client group that I work with um, who have eating disorders, often you've got to work pretty hard to get the conversation started because, you know, you're this practitioner coming in and they're always a bit hesitant and wary of you. So you've got to be pretty good at the small talk and pretty good at, you know, building rapport and and those sorts of things. So I think those skills definitely started when I was, yeah, definitely a Yarra. So Marie Louise, you mentioned in there a little bit about leadership and and the need to, um, I guess, to have your voice heard in those team meetings. And, and I imagine in some of those meetings, there are a lot of people who think their perspective is the most important in the room. And 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 I guess that's from a professional perspective, seeking to help that client the best way. Everybody's got their perspective, and somewhere in the middle of it, you find the right combination of influences to impact that scenario. But I just want to go back a little bit to leadership and particularly student leadership. And you mentioned you yourself, a prefect and a house captain. Wonderful. Congratulations. What do you remember or what do you think now makes a good student leader? What is a what does leadership look like? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one because when I was at school I probably didn't realise that I was a leader, to be honest. Um, I didn't really know. I was surprised when I was elected prefect and house captain and those sorts of things. But um, I was all I was I also remember doing I think it was called Supportive Friends might have been the name of the program. Yeah. And I remember really enjoying like mentoring, um, you know, the younger year levels and, and things like that. And I, you know, in terms of what makes it a good leader, I don't know that I thought about it when I was at school, but um, I think probably there was a lot of inspiration from the people around me. And the thing that I liked about Yarra is that there was really a culture around being successful and like that that was okay. And I didn't always see that in other schools. Um, and I think people had the opportunity to, to thrive in different areas. So if you weren't academic or you could do the arts or you could do debating or there was ski team or there was there was such a variety of things that you could find an area where you could excel in um and so i thought i think that that kind of gave people the opportunity to shine and to do what they really enjoyed um and to i guess to back yourself and have confidence that you can do whatever you know that you want to do and 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 I think a lot of the teachers that I worked with you know the ones that I got on with really helped to develop that that confidence in me and I think that that's a really important part of of leadership for sure is confidence and, and to try things and not always get them right but then you know to be able to kind of nurture that you know those interests that you have. I must admit I'm really pleased to hear maybe well, it sounds like in in the moment, but also on reflection, the your acknowledgement that there was a spot within our school environment where you could shine, even if it wasn't academically. And and in your reflection, everybody could find a spot. And I think that that is truly one of the great um, benefits of a large school, of a well resourced school, is that there is going to be a place where you can shine. I want to take you back to the stage for a moment, Annie, 
Did you, can you remember the role? Did you have a singing, dancing, acting? And did that progress to other um, areas in terms of performance? Like, were you one to be involved in lots of musicals from then on? Or was it one shot, you were a tree and that was it? (laughs) Yeah, I think I was one of the orphans in Annie. Um, I didn't have a super main role, but um, lots of singing, lots of dancing. um, And, I, you know, we were doing it with our best friends. So it was just, it it was really a lot of fun. Um, I think I did one other production, maybe, um, maybe in year 11 or year 12. uh, I can't really remember, but one other, but not really performance wise. Um, I think I've done a lot of public speaking and I, um, I've also run a lot of, I've done a lot of group work since I, you know, since I left Yarra, I've run a lot of groups and, and yeah, and done a lot of public speaking, as I said. So I think, you know, while it didn't necessarily translate into a great acting career, because let's be honest, it's not my strength. Um, I, I think it kind of gave me, I, I guess, a bit of confidence and a bit of a platform to do to do some of those things. Um, yeah. I, I also think the personal development side of things at Yarra was that really was made a massive impact on me. We had a speaker come and talk to our, um, to the students. I think we were in maybe year 12 um, and he came and spoke to the students and um, I ended up going on to do his camps and his programs and did a lot of work with him and that was really instrumental in my career and and in, and in my life so um, that was that was massive um, that was a, that was a massive platform for me um, so mm. no performance but definitely that side of things helped with public speaking and putting myself out there and, and those sorts of things. Fantastic w- were there experiences of debating or doing um, oral presentations through maybe through your English and, and those sorts of subjects. Do you remember? Because public speaking sounds like something that you're quite comfortable with now and it's something that you've developed over time. And and look, the more you do it, chances are the better you get at it. Do you remember any of those moments, maybe the first time and, and the wobbly knees and all that sort of stuff? We, I do hear a few of those sorts of stories. Yeah, I do actually. I was actually thinking about this the other day. Uh, it was in an English class and I can't remember what year it was. Um, and we had to do, the task was to find a visual metaphor. Um, and we had to get up and talk about ourselves in this visual metaphor for like five or 10 minutes. I don't really know. <laughs> I was really nervous. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because you still get those nerves today when you do public speaking or anything like that, but you just see that it's part of it and, it, you know, they pass and then you can just get on with, with the task at hand. But, um, yeah, I remember standing up in front of the class being super nervous and thinking that everybody else seems so confident doing their, their talks about their visual metaphor. And I think, oh, God, I, mine was like an apple or something and I was talking about the layers. I don't know. Don't think it was great, but um, yeah, I remember feeling really out of my depth. Yes, and and even that experience is not a bad one because it's when we're kind of feeling that pressure and feeling like all the eyes are on us that that either we can crumble and we can kind of want to disintegrate into nothing, or we can grow through that experience and and then actually look for those opportunities again. And it seems to me that you've chosen a career where you get to use some of those skills that you've developed, which is fantastic. Tell me a little bit about um, the top end of school in, in regards to um, back in those, it would have been called, it would have been VCE. Um, did you go as well as you wanted to? You don't have to talk numbers, but but did it turn out okay? Because academics wasn't necessarily your strength. And then where did that lead to in terms of a, a course or a you know even even to tell us a little bit more about this platform that you worked through with this mentor and and some of those programs? I'm curious to know what happened sort of right after leaving Yarra. Yeah, look, academics wasn't my strong point, but I was very determined to get a good enter. It was called an enter score back then. Um, and so I did, I did pretty good for me. Like, you know, I wasn't in the nineties. I think I got in the eighties maybe. And I was wrapped with that because academic wasn't really my, my, my strong suit. So, um, that was, that was kind of a nice surprise, but I had to work very hard for it. I definitely wasn't one of those students that just picked things up quite easily. I remember working really hard for it. So, um, I got into like a social science, like an, kind of like an arts course. Um, 
and I was going to then move into psychology. But after a year of studying, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I ended up going overseas and traveling for a while um, because I was super interested, interested in that. So I traveled for a long time. And then when I came back, I started studying social work at uh, Melbourne University. And they didn't necessarily have an enter score requirement then. Um, you had to kind of write an essay and maybe there was even an interview, which was probably more suited to me, that style. So I did so I did um, social work at Melbourne for, it was a three-year course back then. Um, and then from there, I got a job at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, and then I worked there for about six or seven years and then um moved to st vincent's hospital um and yeah worked there for about four years and it seems like you have a particular focus now on um did you say around eating disorders and and what drew you to that is that because you had a friend who who was struggling in that area or maybe a family member or is it something just became of, of interest to you because there were um, certain needs that you could connect with or, or support and help or what ha- how or why does one specialize in that area well as part of my um of the social work degree you had to do two placements which were like six months or something they were quite long placements um and my last placement was on an eating disorder unit um so but i had requested something in that area because when i was in year 12 a lot of the girls developed eating disorders um you know it's such a stressful time and i even see it now with a lot of my clients and so i think i just it just sort of sparked my interest a bit um i was just interested in what they were about i didn't really understand them i saw girls becoming a couple of girls becoming quite unwell um and i and i didn't really understand what it was about so that kind of sparked my interest in it um and then it was you know it was just a bit of dumb luck that i got this placement at the hospital and then a job opened up as i was going you know as i was finishing up and then it just i really loved it and just kind of snowballed from there um yeah and it sounds like you've got a a nice balance going where there's the structure and stability of working in a in a large hospital but also got the whether it's the entrepreneurial or the small business mindset of having your own practice happening now we're recording this in the midst of uh, COVID-19 and and the restrictions that that puts in place and and therefore there are limitations into how people can actually connect and who can be in the room and how many in the room and whether or not you can be in the same room. What does practice look like this year compared with what it might have done 12 months ago? Yeah, well, it, it's, it's an interesting one. So as the other thing that I haven't mentioned that I also work with people who have chronic fatigue um, as well. So that just is a bit of a random other area of interest for me. So my main area is eating disorders, you know, anxiety and depression and, and chronic fatigue. And, um, so a lot of those clients that I work with, um, are bed bound or housebound. They have very limited capacity. And so uh, pre COVID, I was doing a lot of work over Skype anyway, um, because that was just the only way that they could kind of get support. So I was really, used to that style of 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 counseling and coaching um but then i've had a baby this year actually so i'm currently on maternity leave um so that's a great you know have a a baby in a pandemic um but so i haven't done too much work but i'm starting to think about going back to work now and i guess most of it's online uh which i think takes some adjusting to for for people but I, i was kind of used to doing it so it's um it, it wasn't too difficult for me. I I had a home office here, but it's now a nursery. <laughs> um, so yeah. Well, congratulations on not only being able to manage the the kind of the work thing, but now family has come into it in a really real way. Is that baby number one? And how old? And boy, girl, name? Can you give us some details? Sure. Yeah. So it's my first baby. Um, his name's Noah and he's six months old. So, um, yeah, we had him like, you know, at the height of the first wave, really, when there was the restrictions and stuff, um, around who could come into hospital. So I had him and it was just my partner and I in hospital. We could kind of had no, have no visitors. And then even when we came home, it was really limited with visitors and things like that. So it's been, 
a, a massive challenge navigating motherhood, first time motherhood with not the usual supports and stuff around you. But he's um he's a bit of a cute little baby and he's he's keeping us on our toes and he's six months now, so he's at that really nice interactive age. So yeah, we're we're really enjoying it. Fantastic. And and look, you're right. I think being a first time parent is challenging anyway. But add to that the extra, you know, extra things that you really can't control is um, it, it, it requires resilience and it requires um, teamwork and, and patience and getting little snippets of rest when you can. And it's hard work, but it sounds like, and Noah, I love that name. It's beautiful. And, uh, and good to hear that you've reached that stage where it really is that beautiful interaction and the fun and, and the responsive and recognizing you and all of those good things. So, Congratulations. It's a, it's a beautiful experience. Good on you. And th- thank you for sharing that. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about travel because you, you mentioned that you loved travel. If you were to put it down to a go-to destination, once all of this finishes and we're able to go and travel and let's pretend for a moment that we could go anywhere in the world that we wanted to, based on your experience, where would you recommend and why? God, I think it depends what you want. Like now I'd say I just want to go somewhere warm (laughs) where I can lay on a beach. But, you know, back in the day, I loved traveling through Asia. Um, You know, I just took a really small backpack with me and um, just went and sampled all the most amazing food and, you know, met a lot of different people. And it's just so easy to travel around those countries. Um, And there's such a variety of things to do. Um, so that was awesome. I love America because my dad's American. So I have half my family's over there. So that was just always such a nice time for me. Um, you know, America's a bit of a controversial place, I think, but, um, I love New York. Like that just is thriving and it's just like, it's buzzing all the time. I love it there and I've got family there as well. So (laughs) there's that, but then also I would say South America, I, um, I hiked the Inca Trail back in my heyday, um, which was a massive challenge, but that was just also really awesome to see. So I don't know if I could kind of choose one place, um, but I think it's really cool to spend time in other people's cultures and just see the way they live. And I'm such a foodie, so trying all the different foods and stuff, that was, that's the best for me. That's great. And, and certainly just with those couple of snippets, you really have traveled, haven't you? That's fantastic. What a, a great, set of experiences and and whether they're photographs or metaphoric photographs that you've got in your back pocket that you can recall and that you can kind of share with your family as as you continue to grow and maybe uh, maybe be able to go and and share some of those places again and and I guess if you've got family around the world then you're going to want to be able to travel again and uh, and show Noah off to to relatives and so forth yeah I don't know when they're going to get to meet him like America I don't know when and I, and my partner and I, we want to get married as well, um, you know, in the next couple of years, but we want our family from America to be there. And it just feels like, I don't know when that's going to happen. So, Yes, yes. Certainly it ha- has thrown us some challenges and uh, obviously nobody saw it coming, all of those unexpected things. But in the midst of that, it seems to me that you have... Um, got the the foundation of somebody who's going to be able to adapt and going to be able to learn from you know mistakes and setbacks and and times when you fall down and have to kind of brush yourself off and keep going and uh, continue to rise to the challenge and and again and I don't want to harp on this but motherhood is that is part of the journey of uh, of being a parent is having to you know you you get it wrong some of the time and while while we do do our best there are obviously there's going to be times when it, it's not always going to go as as well as we might have hoped tell me a little bit of then about your own family and your own kind of so for example to get from home to Yarra back in the day what did that look like and and what were you leaving when you walked out the the front door or the back door of home did you travel on the bus did you get a, a lift in the car did you walk like how close were you what was home like yeah well my um my parents separated um when I was in year 10 and so um I had two very different experiences of going to school when I was at mum's and when I was at dad's when I was at dad's house he pretty much lived across the road from Yarra so um that was just like a walk. I was late probably 
90% of the time. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Why is that, that when you are so much closer, that those are the, those are the kids that all the time still, the ones who are closest are the ones who are more likely to be late? It's true. You think you've got more time than you do, and I'm not a morning person, so I'd just be, like, pushing it, like, snoozing my alarm a 100 times. Um, so that was... Uh, yeah, that was just a short walk to school. But it was kind of cool because um, when we did the Deb, um, we had Deb training after school. And I remember, uh, you know, maybe training might have started at the practice started at like five o'clock, let's say. But like all my friends, like 20 of my friends would like come over to dad's house and we'd eat him out of house and home, hang out there. And then we'd walk across the road and go back to Deb practice. That was um yeah that was really super fun so that was dad's and then mum's house was um a train and a bus so train to ringwood station and then and then and then the bus trip with all the other people and i just remember always being so scared of the principal or of like one of the teachers being there checking you out to see if your uniform was right or whatever yes they they do and and look i think even today there's still random checks every now and then out on near the public transport near the local shops just to make sure that uh, you're still wearing your uniform with pride and uh, and representing the school very well and and although that may uh, bring some fear and trepidation into a student experience I actually like that we take pride in how we present to the wider community and and I think that's really really important. Do you recall any experiences of what we nowadays call community links or community service where you're making a contribution maybe it's a fundraiser maybe it's a actually getting out into the community and and kind of getting dirt under your fingernails do you remember any of those sorts of experiences yeah i think i remember two that come to mind when you say that one was the um the door knock appeal mm, um i yep. remember i did that for quite a few years and then also and i don't know what this was but i remember going to a hospital or something like that and volunteering with some kids and spending time. I think they were kids that had cancer and spending time just hanging out with them. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't remember the details of that, but I remember doing that stuff and, and really, really, really enjoying it. And the door knock appeal was always, you know, it was, it was always fun. I mean, I was always kind of that way inclined anyway to kind of be helping and giving back. That was in my DNA, I think. So, mm. and, and- certainly is what you do as a as a career now is you're there to help you're there to serve you're there to try and help your your client to work through the challenges and give them some strategies and some suggestions on how they can make their experience a little bit more um palatable i guess and 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 maybe even turn it into something that's um useful and helpful i wonder if you can tell us a little bit about um trips, stumbles and falls, a time, whether it be at school or, or maybe after school, where things did not go according to plan. And how do you respond to, let, let's call it failure, although you might have a, a perspective on whether it actually is failure or not, but when things don't go well, how do you respond? Yeah, like this is a really interesting one and oh, I think it's really important because I think there's a lot of people that do the job that I do there's a lot of psychologists or counselors or whatever that do the job that I do and I think to be good at that you have to have navigated challenge and you have to have kind of sat in discomfort and uncertainty and and those sorts of things I think that that's really important because I don't think you can sit in front of somebody who's really you know in the depths of depression or anxiety or an eating disorder um, in these challenges and be able to support them unless you've been through sort of those struggles yourself so I think a big one for me that comes to mind is um, I developed chronic fatigue um, when uh, I was in my late 20s um, and I was that pretty much meant that I was bed bound for about six months I just was at work one day and I didn't really feel right um, and I went home and just really I just really went downhill very quickly um and yeah I was basically stuck in bed for about six months like I couldn't really shower I couldn't stand up in the shower um without getting very fatigued I'd have to kind of sleep after that I was really unwell and the doctors didn't know what was wrong with me and I spent a good part of a year trying to just find out what the hell was wrong 
Um, and so I think I was sick for about four years altogether, um, from the worst being bed bound to, I guess, getting myself back to the stage where I'm fully functioning now and I don't have any symptoms and, um, you know, I'm quite a busy person and I've got a, a lot of my plate and I can juggle a lot of things now. So that's definitely been my biggest challenge. Um, and yeah, that was, a. it was at the time it was really uncomfortable and really painful. And I felt like I was missing out on so much of life, but I learned so much from that. And it changed me so much that I, and I always tell my clients, like, I'm super grateful for how hard that experience was because it just kind of helped me to evaluate like what was important in my life, where I hadn't been kind of taking care of myself, you know, what my priorities were and really gave me an opportunity to look at that stuff and, and, and make better decisions for myself Mm. I mean that's really powerful and I appreciate the value that it offers you in your life experience as you seek to help others who are going through you know tough times who in the moment would say take this from me I don't want this it it interests me and I've heard it before and and I I think I understand the notion of going through hard times, experiencing those um, challenges and difficulties. On the other side of that, we can be grateful. We can recognise the lessons. We can see how it's grown you or strengthened you or or made you more resilient. But in the midst of that, and, and if I think to past students who they had an experience maybe when they were at school that was really tough and really awkward and really challenging, or even some of our current students who are going through, and and whether it's a diagnosed thing or just a, a it might be a, a family circumstance that nobody else knows about, are there any general principles? And, and I know this is kind of a loose question, but are, are there some maybe three or four things that you would say to me if I'm in the midst of turmoil, challenge, struggle, and I can't see the other end of it. And I, it, when you tell me that you're going to be grateful for this eventually, although you, you might not tell me that, but but that's what I'm hearing is that apparently it's going to all be okay in the end. What are some things that you would tell me and, and obviously then our audience that would help us in the day-to-day right now? Yeah, I think a couple of things like... I think when you're in a struggle of any description, whatever age you are, whatever your background is, whatever, is just being really curious about the struggle. Our instinct when we're in a difficult situation is to kind of avoid it and uh, try and not think about it or just try and survive in it. Um, Our instinct is not to be curious about it and maybe try and understand why it's happening or what sort of things it's bringing up. Um, And it's like that is not easy you know no one wants to sit in this uncomfortable time and then be curious about it it's definitely not easy but in my experience it's the fastest way to navigate challenge is to get curious about what's going on I think that that's really important um I think having somebody that you can talk to is super important and it doesn't matter who it is like if seeing a counselor is not your thing that's fine like as long as there's somebody who you can be really honest with about what's going on I think it's important because um we can't we often can't navigate problems on our own we need to kind of talk to somebody else about it who could maybe offer a different perspective or, or, or whatever um and I think that that's really important it's usually the opposite of what you want to do in those times people typically want to withdraw um Mm. they kind of get a bit more isolated um and that can often make things worse so sometimes you know i'm a big one for like pushing it's like if you're going to push yourself in one area when you're in challenge push yourself to get some support from somewhere i think that that's that's super important um because chances are somebody has navigated the challenge that you're having um Mm. and if they've navigated it they can probably help you to navigate it. Or if you just tell one person, you know, like if you're looking for, um, I don't know, a new bike, if you text 10 of your friends and say, I'm looking for a new bike, chances are you'll get a new bike pretty soon because somebody will be like, oh, I've got a friend who knows, whatever. Um, I think it's the same thing with any any challenges that we have. Someone's probably navigated it. Um, And, you know, like obviously my area is psychology and social work and and that sort of thing. And I'm a big one for if you're going to go and see somebody, make sure they're good. 
<laughs> make sure that you connect with them um, and you should start to feel better or notice change pretty early on in the piece if, if you're seeing a psychologist or whatever and I think sometimes people stick with therapists because they should be able to help them but um, be picky find someone who you connect with and who, who you feel like can help you um, yeah so I don't know if that answers your question yeah no that that's terrific I, I, and I, I agree with you that some of those things don't actually come to mind straight away. Like that notion of being curious about it, actually all you want to do is get away from it. So so that notion of actually moving toward it and, and actually sitting in that discomfort is is a I think it's good advice. Not easy to do, but it's a helpful, helpful thing to and and the idea of um walking with somebody, having somebody to to walk through, whether they be a professional or not, and if they are a professional, make sure that it's actually working and that it's uh, helping you and and not being afraid to to make that hard, maybe hard decision to say, actually, this is not working. I still need help. I'm going to go and try something else. Um, but But in the midst of that curiosity, you wouldn't, I think, necessarily want somebody to be hopping from professional to professional to professional because then actually the curiosity goes hang on what is it the consistent thing here is is actually me am am I just avoiding something along the way you know and and I guess we could go deeper and deeper into that but but let's not for now but I appreciate the the perspective and and what you've offered just as some general principles that are worth us pondering further so thank you I appreciate that I wonder if I might take you now, uh, Marie Louise, from the class of two thousand and two, to a, a little section of our um, conversation called the lightning round, quick fire. We're going to throw a, a bunch of ideas or concepts, or and and just for you to kind of just land on the first thing that pops into your head. It might be true, or it might be just the base of a good story. <laughs> Tell us, um, Marie Louise, when you were at Yarra, what house were you in? I was in Annals. Annals. Now, back in the uh, early 2000s and thereabouts, were Annals any good? Yeah, we were great. Yeah, I was the house captain. We were awesome. <laughs> and and what was your biggest contribution to the house competition in terms of was it in athletics? Was it in swimming? Was it in the house drama? Was it in, deb- you know, where did you shine? Athletics, definitely. That was my that was my area. I definitely was not swimming. Ever I think everyone dreaded that that swimming carnival, um, except for a few who are amazing swimmer. Um, but no, athletics. That was that was mine. I was a hundred and two hundred sprinter. Uh, very good, very good. I must admit, I've um, recently enjoyed what m- must be the twenty year anniversary of the Sydney Olympics and Kathy Freeman and reliving all of that again and just such a powerful force the 400 meter just magnificent magnificent i so i agree so good um i wonder if you can uh, recall who were the or what no who were the school captains back in your day yeah so sean gooden and tom oliver um and like i really couldn't think of two better school captains and i don't know what tom's doing now but um, I still talk to Sean from time to time and follow kind of her career and stuff. And she, you know, she's just living up to, I think, school captain, um, you know, uh, just, just the way that she is and the things that she does. She's still a leader in her community and does a lot to give back and all that. So, yeah. Fantastic. That's terrific. That's great. What would we regularly find in your lunchbox while you're a student at Yarra? Um, probably like a toasted cheese sandwich. I just remember like we had like a sandwich press in the locker room and um, just the toasted cheese sandwich was just the, the most amazing thing. Do you remember how well that was looked after and cared for and cleaned up? I don't think it was great. <laughs> I don't think it was great. I don't think the hygiene factor was up there. No, I think it's uh, probably still the same. Um, what was your first car that you owned and drove? I think it was a Ford Laser. Mm. Colour? It was red and it didn't have power steering and it Ooh. was a real beast to drive, yeah. But I got it for free so I couldn't complain. That's great. Did it have a name? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. If I was coming to your house for dinner and you were cooking, what would you serve up? What's your kind of specialty? What would be something that you are really good at in the kitchen? 
Uh, well, last night I made, <laughs> I don't know if I'm good at it, but last night I made um, taco mints and um, guacamole and we had like it had it in lettuce leaves and stuff. I tend to cook pretty healthy, so um, I don't know if it's that exciting, but it's, uh, I don't know, it's healthy. <laughs> No, that's good. That's good. And and if I had the opportunity or you had the opportunity to invite three people from past, present, future, they might be famous people or people in your own family that you haven't seen for a while, who else would you invite to dinner? Any three people from any any era, anywhere in the world? Um, Brene Brown is the first one that comes to mind. I am okay. a massive Brene Brown, Brene Brown fan. I, um, I met her actually uh last year and I was really starstruck so I just like happily have her give us a, a a 30 second what's where like you're not seeing her on a sports field necessarily you're not seeing her as an artist why Brene Brown Brene Brown is a social worker she's like the only person to probably make social work cool and she is known for um her uh, conversation around vulnerability and how important it is um in you know in um living a fulfilling life so she is definitely one who else would i have this is really interesting um probably someone from um, my family in america yep. for sure i can't pick because if they ever hear this then you know like i'll be in all sorts of trouble but definitely one of my cousins from america would be awesome because i never get to see them they are absolutely amazing um and who else oh and beyonce this is so cliche, but probably Beyonce. I feel like we have a lot to chat about. <laughs> of course, of course. That No, that's good. I like it. Take me back to Yarra again. Was there a piece of work that you were particularly proud of, whether it be a, a photographic exhibition or whether it be a, a piece of English literature writing uh, that you worked on or maybe a maths test that you really scraped hard to, to get a pass? A piece of work that comes to mind? Yeah, um, it was one of my photography pieces and it was um, of like some water and there was like all these reflections in the water of buildings and the sky and it was, um, I don't know, I guess it was, um, it got top listed for um, some exhibition, I can't really remember, um, but it was, you know, it was, a, a, I don't what was it called? The Top Arts Exhibition or something like that. I don't know, but I just remember being really chuffed that one of my pieces had made it in. Yeah, fantastic. It, it must have been really good for it to be kind of recognised at the next level up is, uh, is tremendous. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> if everything goes really well over the next, I don't know, let's say three to five years, what does life look like on planet Marie-Louise? Um... Probably having another kid would be good once I get the hang of this, this one. Um, and really passionate about growing my business. So I'd like that to be really thriving. Um, it just kind of, I started to hit my straps before I went on maternity leave. Um, so I really love that and I'm really keen to expand it, you know, more than just counselling, but kind of putting together um, programs and, you know, resources for people. I've written a... Um, a, a, a small book for um, carers of people with chronic fatigue about how to support someone with chronic fatigue. So um, that's just kind of the beginning, but I'm hoping to really grow that that side of my business when I can. Mm, important work. Fantastic. And and I guess demystifying some of those um, those challenges, because obviously, unless you've been through it before, chances are you don't really know what's going on and and how to care for that. And, and yeah, so I, I think that's important work. What is the what book have you just finished reading or what book are you reading now? Um, the book I'm reading, it's called Do Less. Do Less? Do Less, yeah, yeah. Um, and I can't remember the name of the lady that wrote it, um, but she is talking about, I guess, prioritising what's really important um, and just spending time doing the things that that you really enjoy rather than um, being a super busy person all the time, which is definitely my... Uh, nature and my instinct is to be super busy all the time so that kind of came at a good time when uh, you know motherhood and trying to balance all that stuff so yeah yes and I wonder was that a, a 
offered to you and given to you and recommended to you by somebody close or was it something that you thought actually this is something I need to maybe hear the concepts behind this idea my best friend gave it to me when I was pregnant and I tried to read it like three or four times and I was like oh god I'm just not getting into this and she was like you should really read it you'll really like it and I could just I, I couldn't read it at the time but now I'm like oh, I really need to read that book no, that's, that's good. That's helpful. I wonder if there is uh, an app or a, a habit or a tool that you use regularly that has really made a difference in your life. Um, I think two things come to mind. I love yoga um, or just like any, any kind of form of exercise. Yoga and F45 seem to be on different ends of the playing field. But they I do. <laughs> I really like the sweat of F45 and I really like the strength of, of yoga. So I, I think exercise is super important. Um, oh, they're probably like the two main things actually. Yeah, just like I think exercise, it just helps in so many areas um, of your mental health and your physical health and all that stuff. So I think that that's been a really big part of my life and I hope to, you know, be fit and strong, you know, when I'm a grandma. <laughs> Very good, very good. I, I wonder if you could reflect on the notion of success. What does success mean to you? Um, I think the cliche is being happy, but I think more than that, it's just about doing what feels authentically right to you and who you are as a person. I think it's so easy to get caught up in what everybody else is doing and what you know the world tells you is important but I think for me it's really about being authentic to myself and just living a life that's consistent with that. Mm. I've really appreciated your ability to talk and to share your experiences and and put your words together so uh, eloquently and I appreciate your time you've been really generous and I wonder if I've, I've just got two more questions and we'll all but have to round out our time and and one of them is to to offer you a phrase that you may or may not resonate with and that is lavavi oculus do you recall what that might mean and what does it mean yeah I think it's something about lifting up your eyes or we lift up our eyes or something like that. Yes, it's our school motto. Yeah. Look, I have to say at school, I don't think that that really resonated with me necessarily. Um, but if I think about it now, I don't know. I don't think this is probably what it means, but I think um, uh, if you think about lifting up your eyes or, or, or shifting your gaze is being able to maybe look at something from a different perspective um, and try and just, I don't know, seek to understand. I think there's a, um, everything's so controversial in the world today and everybody has very strong opinions on things. Um, seek to understand, I think, is, is a good place for everyone to start. Mm, I like that. I like that a lot. And my final question is, uh, what question did you really want me to ask you today? And once you've answered that question, can you answer the question? Um, what question did I really want you to ask me? Maybe something about my job um, and what I and what I did for a job. I think I don't know why. I, oh, I do know why. Actually, that's silly. I just I really love what I do. Um, Great, you're passionate about it. I really, yeah, I really like it, and I think it's cool to talk about. Like, I'm always interested in what people are passionate about, you know. And I'm sure that this podcast is full of that, like people talking about, you know, their different things. And I found it so cool to see all like people that I went to school with from all the different year levels, like where they ended up. You know, I think that that's so interesting and thinking about what they were like at school and then, you know, kind of what, what they've done with their lives. I find that that's super interesting. So I think like for me to talk about my, my work is just interesting and I wonder what the teachers would think about, you know, the teachers that, um, that you know, taught me at school what they'd think about what I'd done and if they ever got sick of me talking in class and see that maybe now it was my blessing. <laughs> Well, I'm about to do a survey on all of your teachers and find... No, I'm not really. <laughs> oh, God, I please wonder... don't. I apologise <laughs> to them. <laughs> I did hear recently um, a similar notion of, you know, and, and I'm not sure whether it was in your experience, but sometimes people um, hear things maybe even towards the end of their time at their school and, and it's almost a prediction of what their peers think or thought that they might have gone on and done. Just to turn that slightly, do you think 
your peers, your friends, your cohort would be surprised at what you're doing or would they say, ah, no, that actually makes sense. Yep, she was she was caring, she was nurturing, she loved to talk. No, no, of course she's going to be leading conversation groups and discussion groups and, and helping people through that and, and, and she's a good listener and she's able to, like, would they go, yeah, that's a good fit? So I don't know, but I think if you ask them, I was definitely one of the people at school that people would go to when they were having a tough time, you know. So I don't think it would have been a massive surprise to anybody that I that I ended up in the area that I did. Mm. No, that that's good. And and this is actually my last question is, and it may be an opportunity to talk about home or work or a combination, but. I want to give you the chance to have a 30-second brag. Don't hold back. Don't be humble. What's working really, really well for you right now? What are you really proud of that's happening in your life? Um, I think the thing I would say about that is probably just how my partner and I have navigated being first-time parents in a pandemic. Um, it, you know, it's been really challenging. My partner's in the... Um, in the tourism industry, they had 90, 80%, 98% of their business came from America. So, um, he, you know, him and I aren't really working at the moment. Um, we're just raising this beautiful little boy. Um, we've, you know, we, don't, we didn't really know anything about kids before we had a kid. So I just feel really proud of the way that we've handled it. And like, it's definitely had its challenges, but it's also been super amazing as well. So, yeah. Mm. That is, uh, Admittedly challenging, but it sounds like time well spent. And for many parents, uh, I think some years down the track, we look back and we go, gee, where, you know, it's classic and it's cliche, but where did the time go? And if you can really savor and be grateful for the opportunity that you have as as much as it creates challenges in other areas of life to to be able to sit with and to be with and to kind of ride this wave together as a family unit is is a beautiful thing and and one of those things that like you said before it's challenging in the moment but you look back on it and you go actually that was foundational. That was really significant for us as a, as a couple, but also us as a, as a family unit. Um, there may be a time, and, and I reckon you're, you're just about there already, where you look back and go, that was the best thing that could have Yeah, and it's so awesome for my partner who would never have this much time, you know, with his little boy. So it's like, I, you know, it's a hard time, but I guess you can't really wallow in that and just try and, you know, uh, be as positive as possible. Yes, terrific. Marie Louise Metris from the class of 2002. Thank you for sharing your journey, sharing or parts of it at least, and uh, and for spending this time with us. I really appreciate, as I mentioned before, your your honesty and your candid nature and your ability to observe and reflect and and I guess contemplate what's been going on and and the journey that you've been on. So. It seems to me that you have been inspired by parts of your experience at Yarra and certainly as you continue to make a difference in the world, um, one client at a time, you are an inspiration to us back at Yarra. So for that, we are grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you. Thanks for taking me down memory lane and uh, it's been good to have a reminisce. And that all but wraps up another episode of Inspired by Yarra and... As we reflected towards the end of that conversation, she really did put some words and some thoughts together in a really eloquent way. I really appreciate her time and her wisdom as she shared. As a recap, just noted down the value of being curious of the struggle, the challenge that you might be experiencing. Having someone to talk to, somebody to walk with you, to share the experience, to offer their professional or not perspective and experience. And as well, the concept, the notion, the guidance to seek wise counsel, maybe professional, in order to help you on your way. And not to settle, but to find someone who really can help you move forward. Really appreciated Marie Louise's comments, contribution, wisdom, and guidance along the way. If you know 
Marie Louise, or if you know somebody who does, you might want to recommend, you might want to encourage them to tune in and listen as well. Or as you may be aware, we've got a growing library of conversations with Yarra Old Grammarians that each have their own story, that each have their own wisdom and their own journey that they share. And there's lots of value. We'd encourage you to share it and to continue to grow those who tune in and are connected through this medium. Make sure that you subscribe, whether it be on iTunes, Apple Play, via whatever podcast player app you are using. My name's Paul Joy, and on behalf of everyone here at Yarra, in particular those who put these conversations together and share them with you, I want to wish you another day of inspiration where you are proactive and intentional about making a positive impact in the world around you.